what comes is um, often in the curriculum of class three that's associated farming and gardening so in the seasons and also you can become aware of the root the leaf the flower and the fruit in as part of the plant and um, and in sort of it's involved in gardening and where some some plants are particularly root vegetables or their leaf or their flower or their fruit just becoming aware of those those fournesses there maybe looking at the maybe becoming aware of the seven grains seven main edible grains there are far more now but there's sort of seven traditional ones corn which is big and large and very much a grain of the west wheat rye barley oats millet they're from Africa and rice in the east and rice is a very light and when you see the plant it's sort of all the the grains are sort of out on the end of little little tips whereas a corn cob you know everything all tight in together and and heavy so it's a wonderful difference around the world whether you bring that into you know that depends on your ability and your interest and you're able to find examples of these things but I mean there it's a topic that may that may be um, looked at so in I've got here the traditional human occupations because farming and gardening is one of the you might say when human beings maybe came out of just the the hunter-gatherer phase of evolution there came a time of actually cultivating the earth turning the plow to the earth digging cultivating and so this is one you might say a traditional occupation uh, and so this whole thing of becoming more aware of the earth and the planting and caring and harvesting those sort of things whereas another traditional occupation again when you move from being just a hunter-gatherer if you're going to cultivate the land you often set down and create a house and this whole picture of a house is creating a shelter but it's also a picture of having an inward space an outer and at this age of class three this is an experience children are going through it's called this nine-year-old Rubicon some cases talking about Julius Caesar there um, and so what happens there for the children is they become aware of their own soul nature they are aware they become aware not so consciously they're aware that their own inner life is theirs alone earlier they felt that what they experienced everyone experienced you know, it was just you know and as I say the common thing was that young children can go to their parents and talk to them and expect the parents to know what they're talking about and parents are very quick and they kind of work it out and then it dawns that that they know the teacher doesn't know what they're thinking and you sometimes see um, just grab a piece of paper oh now I just going to grab one here you can sometimes see um, kid in the back of the classroom <laughs> this is a real picture I'm here and you're out there hmm? this sort of the separation <coughs> the separation and aware that my thoughts are mine and are not known my feelings are mine my will impulses are also unknown that's scary and lonely on the one part let's have the lights on at night okay things like that and also as I say sometimes it can lead to 
I can tell lies because no one else knows what I'm really thinking. I can say something else. And uh, I say, sometimes you can have parents come in, what have you done to my child? She's turned out to be a liar and a thief. Because a thief is also one that can take things because no one knows what you're doing. It's all right, it doesn't last forever for most cases. <laughs> you grow through it. But it's sort of, but this is, this is this time when children are going through this inwardness and loneliness and the curriculum wants to do, it takes you in and you go out and relate to the world outside. So here, now, you go and look outside. So we look at the farming and gardening processes. We look at this traditional thing of creating a house which separates the inner and the outer. And, and one of the things that comes into this is the cooperation between people. That cooperation needs to go on, uh, and so on. There's a whole element, so whether you want to bring it into, into house building, but it lies there. The house, you know, is the very physical part, and, and so there's the physical materials. There's another part, and that is the builder, who puts it all together, takes all the materials. This is like our etheric body that sort of moves and great makes things grow. That's the builder. But there's another person who plans it, that's the architect. And that's like the astral body that sort of says, that needs to know how everything, this is the why, why is this here, why is that there? The builder says, oh yes, okay, build a wall, put it up, and do follow all the plans. But the architect knows why and then the ego, of course, is the occupier whose house it will be. And so the architect works with the, bill, with the owner saying, so what are you going to be doing in this house? What do you need in these different parts? I can remember going through having a house built and thinking, oh, we'll have so many rooms. And the architect said, no, 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 we don't start there. He says, what do you want to do in this house? It got back to the will element of the ego. You as owner, what are you going to do? And not, not to sort of make a list of rooms. I, I found that quite, quite illuminating and ended up with something very different than, than just a list of rooms. But it's this element of going out and these two traditions, putting a shelter and then engaging with the earth. Something of the... Um, of class of class three and with the house building you come all sorts of things into measurement you know to build a house you've got to measure things and so you can start with the measuring you start from yourself how do you measure the distance right how many feet you measure like that using yourself or, how does a, a farmer you know, measure the size of a horse? By hands. Sixteen hands, that's a horse. Less, it's a pony. Um, what does a, uh, a fisherman do for measuring, bringing in rope? Get a rope, they put the rope. One fathom. Two fathoms. Three fathoms, four fathoms, five fathom deep, you know, where my father lies. But um, so that's using, using the body and sort of, this is not going outwards, spans. You have the fathom. This is the yard that the, that the, from your nose to your tip of your finger, which is half a fathom, people who are weaving typically, and that's sort of a, they measure a yard of cloth. You want a good deal? Go to a tall weaver. <laughs> Half of that is the L, the elbow to the thing. Half of that is the span. Half of that, the hand. Quarter of that, you get into the inches and so on. So that, um, so all out of the, a lot of things based on the human body as, as a beginning. Only later, 
did uh, much later did people come up with taking a different basis, partly because people are different in size, so going by feet is not quite accurate enough. So you had to have the king's foot. You know that the... Um, well, it wasn't the king's foot. What the king did, and at least in one place, one story was, got 16 people coming out of, I think it was some church or cathedral, and got them all lined up with all their their different feet. Sort of, um, So there were 16 people with their feet, 16 right feet there, and then put a rope beside it, and then you fold that in half, eight, half, four, half, two, half again, and you could, by dividing that, you could get one foot, an average foot. A whole new picture then. It was sort of not individual, but now here's the community foot. And it was put on, <laughs> marked on a building. Foot. The official foot. Um, yeah, all sorts of interesting, yeah, we won't go into that now, but there's sort of those, those things that went on. And then the French people, much later, in their more intellectual capacity, said, well, all different things around the earth. The thing is that's common for everyone is that we all live on the earth. And so all well, the basis of our measurement should be the earth itself. That's fine. They had this, this uh, academy, this French academy, and they said, well, what we'll do is we'll take the distance between the North Pole and the equator and call that 10 million units. Right, so, let's measure it. Uh-oh. There's no pole at the North Pole, and there's no line at the equator. And if you go north from Paris to the Arctic, and it's very, very cold, and there's a lot of sea in the way, and anyway, it's an ice cap, and there's no, I say, no pole to know where it is. And if you go south, you go across the Sahara Desert and end up in the Atlantic, just below the bump in Africa. There's no line there either. <laughs> so, great idea, but a certain impracticality in it. But in the end, they made a compromise. They said, right, we'll measure from Barcelona, going north over the Pyrenees, through Paris, to not Calais, yeah, some, sit, some city on the coast there, but they could measure. That was a portion of the way. And they said, well, we can work out how it is. We can see the pole star. We say the elevation of the pole star here is this at, at um, Barcelona. And at the other end is not Calais, but they find, and find a difference. And they said, well, yes, it's about a tenth of the distance. So they surveyed it. This was all the time of the French Revolution. And um, it took them seven years to do this. It's quite, quite some a surveying thing because you can't go in a straight line. It goes up and down. It's a real challenge to measure such a long distance and do it accurately. And then, when you've done that, what do you do with it? Yeah. Well, they had to make a metal bar when they'd worked it all out because they had to use their own feet in order to get the measurement. And then they said, right, this is three and about a three and a third feet was this meter, the measure. And so, you know, if you know the meter, it's 10 million meters from the pole to the equator, or that is 10,000 kilometers. So to go right around the world is 40,000 kilometers. You so that's by definition. And so they made this thing, and now what do they do with it? Well, they made it out of very special metal that would, wouldn't expand and contract with the heat because that would throw it all out. So they put it in a deep vault in, uh, in the basement of the French Museum in Paris. Mm 